logistics is that people want things cheaper and faster. They always will, no matter what they say, even a small increment of little easier, little cheaper, little faster goes such a long way. And that's just always going to be true. So it's like easy to like, okay, I'm going to go in, I'm going to build in this space. Uh, and as long as we can make logistics a little cheaper, a little easier, um, a little faster, who knows how big it will be, but like, we'll win a little bit. I'm overly excited to meet you. I've been following Pipe Dream and you and some of the dudes on your team for a long time. And it's just like a very fun roller coaster ride. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's uh it's a good way to describe it. Yeah, it's it is like I don't know. I think there's something to especially on Twitter, tech being like a spectator sport. And this is a very fun company to watch and to root for. So I'm excited to kind of like get a chance to get deeper into it with you. Oh, appreciate it, man. Yeah, I've never heard anyone like we, we talk about that all the time. It's like Sometimes I feel like, and we are so guilty of that in the last six months of, it's like, man, let me on the inside. I want to see like more highlights, more action, more clips. Like it, it's our spectator sport. We love it. You know? Yeah. And you've got a great like pin thread that kind of takes you through what's going on at the company. And, uh, it is a really fun thing, especially for something like pipe dream, which is so complex. Like there's just so many moving parts, you know, it's, it's, um, and it's a lot more tangible than than just a software company. So maybe you can give us like, for people who are unfamiliar and haven't been following along, but should be, give us a high level, like what's Pipe Dream? What's your hope for it? And how can we picture it? Yeah, totally. So at a high level, you know, we, we see the world of autonomous logistics going kind of one step farther to this next level uh, that we call hyper logistics. It's just essentially like, how do you make goods move so easy and cheaply that it moves like data does on the internet. And the part that we saw that was missing to get there was kind of this utility layer for moving goods around. Um, something that can handle the uh, going in, in and out of buildings, both on the supply side and the uh, residential side. Uh, then also going those longer distances uh, in cities and between cities. Um, and then managing the handoff in between, you know, it's a, logistics today is multimodal it goes into a lot of different you know people's hands and different vehicles and Thomas logistics will be the same thing hand off to drones receive from drones hand off self-driving cars receive from self-driving cars so that was the layer that we saw was missing um and so at pipe dream we build infrastructure uh to solve that and a lot of it runs like um utilities run today which is through underground pipes so hence the name <laughs> yeah that is so um a, a really counterintuitive thing to me is how much more expensive it is to go that last you know we hear about last mile logistics but like people don't realize that's nine eighty percent ninety percent i don't know what you you probably have a much 40. more accurate figure 40 which is still like nuts because you're talking about pears grown in argentina shipped to china to can <laughs> shipped to america shipped to your city in a grocery store and then after all of that 40 percent of the cost is just to go like half mile down the road to your house uh which that's is wild gnarly <laughs> yeah okay so so if i'm interpreting correctly the, the vision for pipe dream or the purview may even be bigger than i was expecting based on what you just said there so it sounds like you think of yourself as that I don't know, in the fullness of time, at least, like a full suite of that last mile logistics and trying to make all of that autonomous. Is that right? Yeah, I, I think it's maybe close to, um, I think last mile logistics is just so complicated. I mean, logistics as a whole is complicated. Um, so I, I, I think trying to eat the whole apple is uh, a, a pipe dream, for, for lack of a better <laughs> word. Uh, <laughs> but um, it, the, the, what is certain is that that was a gap um and uh i think you know it, who knows how much of, of last mile logistics that kind of infrastructure will make up and how many other companies will be doing that um we think it's a it's a big part um so yeah I, i'm not sure how much that will constitute uh, or into the day or if any but um we think it's big enough to go for so um, okay, it won't be, so i don't think it'll be the whole thing kind of like a like a it's just like a really important api 
um, or maybe like cloud computing is maybe like a better thing. It's like this base level infrastructure. A lot of things go in and out of it. A lot of different companies do it, but each one of them makes up this massive part of the market. Okay, so so let's do it. Let's do the English version, um, or I'll, or I'll give it a shot and you correct me. So there's going to be robots in tunnels, in utility tunnels, that take this can of pears from my grocery store to my house. Yeah, totally. Uh, with, with some, um, if you think about it, kind of like, uh, I, I think if, if we were to look into the future 10 years from now, um, that can of pears will sit outside the city. Um, and then at some point, the uh, you'll have, you know, this local distribution center, whether it's like a grocery store or some like small distribution center, half mile from your house. Um, and the, you know, there will be five cans of pears held there. Uh, two people order some, those go out, and then uh, to resupply that small set of can of pears near your house, uh, two more get pulled in from outside the city in the bigger distribution center. Um, and then from there, uh, when you order the can of pears, then um, a drone or self-driving car or um, whatever autonomous modality works in that area will come up to that really small, what will essentially be like a vending machine, like a, a store size vending machine. Um, they'll deploy that can of pears to the vehicle, uh, go to your house, drop it in your house. Um, our vision for that is that kind of like computers have a USB port, um, there needs to be that kind of same infrastructure for interfacing with uh, autonomous modalities. Um, so instead of that can of pears just getting dropped off in your backyard, uh, it's better if it's dropped into something like an internal mailbox. Um, so then you just open your drawer, can of pears is there, uh, you grab them and use them. Um, and I, I think like that's kind of where you don't know, like maybe there is like a bigger, broader underground network and it's, you know, a little bit cheaper to do that than the other robotic modalities. And it's just all pipes. Um, I think those cases will be rare, but, you know, who knows? Interesting. I mean, this is some suggestion shit that I can really get into, right? Like stuff just flying around in pipes. Um, that's what it's all about. That's what the future is supposed to look like. And I mean, I live in an apartment building right now. You know, there's already a package locker. I don't think it's a huge stretch and mailboxes. Like it's not a huge stretch that that becomes, you know, a, a little bit of a portal for a tunnel to a distribution center. Um, it is probably way cheaper and simpler to do it underground. So a, a thing I'm curious about is actually the, like, what is, what is the existing infrastructure for this? How much, I mean, are you, do you have to like go down and bore your own tunnels or are there existing utility tunnels that you can use? How much, like, how does that part of it work? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I, when we, when we first started the company, that was kind of, you know, you have two paths is either like, okay, you can go down the hard path or the easy path. Um, <laughs> there probably is a lot of infrastructure that we convert. The question is, nobody knows how much. Um, that, that isn't like public data. It's not like on the, you know, the GIS portal there, like there's no way to know how much, um, you kind of got to go city by city and find the person in the know and figure it out. Um, so our thought was let's let that be the icing on the cake. Let's work and make sure that the business model works on new infrastructure. Cause if it doesn't work on new infrastructure, then we're never going to get the, um, that, uh, the, the big enough network to be interesting at all. It'd just be like, super happenstantial uh, pipe that happened to be there and we'll convert it. And that, that's not, uh, you can't grow a network that way. So we decided just ignore that for now. Let's focus the whole thing on building them out ourselves. But the good news is like, cities have gotten really good at putting this underground structure in. Um, it, it's one of those things where 15 years ago, I think we all saw a lot of streets being torn up to put underground infrastructure in. Um, and just so much improvement in putting this type of pipe in the ground has happened and so that we, we kind of don't even see it being put in, but we, I mean, cities are putting in miles and miles and miles of exactly this type of pipe um, every year. Uh, and once you know what the machines look like that put it in, you, you kind of start seeing it like all over the place. Um, but yeah, they, they've gotten really good. So it, we realized pretty quick that um, as long as we kept it really close to the way that cities already put in underground pipes and keep the the infrastructure the same, construction methods, the even down to like the actual pipes um, that are the most common. Um, then everything gets a lot easier. So, are they putting it down like for you? Do you have to pay them to do it? How does this? How does it work? 
Yeah. Um, so it, it works. Uh, if, if you imagine kind of like how electricity went in, uh, we really see ourselves as in that analogy, the, uh, um, like the wire makers, <laughs> like we're making the wire. Um, and then the way that it goes in is, is kind of, it's different depending on the city and like the property. So if we're looking at like a grocery store, we're just going to sell that infrastructure to the grocery store, right? Um, if they want to automate their pickup, um, we're just going to sell that to them, uh, and then manage the maintenance and upgrades for them. Um, in cities, uh, the, the current thought process is to go the way of fiber railroads, um, where you allow people to invest in putting in the infrastructure and sharing the profits long term. And there's just so many infrastructure groups uh, and financing companies that are set up to uh, manage that infrastructure and finance it and sit on it for a long time. Um, so we really don't want to re reinvent the wheel there. Um, so we have some interesting ideas um, long term on on how to maybe tweak the way that railroads and fiber um, financialize themselves. Uh, it's really interesting if you like going back and reading newspaper articles about railroads. And there's all these articles about how like railroads a bubble, it's never going to be useful. <laughs> like, it's just like, you could just swap railroad for NFT and it'd, it'd be, uh, you know, <laughs> or, or, like a great NFT bubble article. Um, like we don't want to get there, but I, I think um, we, we can borrow from uh, some of the ways that um, railroad and fiber incentivize people to bootstrap the network. Um, and so that's that's the goal. Uh, we there, there's some things we need to tweak and improve out, um, but we really kind of want to sit the the bottom of that. Um, yeah, you know, build all the 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 pieces to make it work, make it easy to put in, um, and then make sure we have really uh, attractive rev share models. Um, kind of it's kind of so that like in, you know an Amazon or or someone of that size, uh, if they're looking at doing it themselves and finding the regulatory battle or just going with us, let us shoulder the regulatory responsibility, but then they get this great rev share. Um, it's a no brainer just to go that way. Yeah. It's a fascinating, I mean, I love companies like this that are just such audacious undertakings. Um, but man, yeah, you find yourself in the middle of a lot of moving pieces of like, oh, who's going to pay for this place who, part? Who's going to pay for this part? What are the regulatory things and how are they different in each city? Um, so how are you approaching that on the on the rollout side of things are you just getting into regulatory? yeah you're like finding one sort of geographic location or one partner who's like all in on this and psyched about it and that's kind of where you get to prove things out i guess i don't know who's the most who's the most instrumental like who's the the hardest to get on board of all the different stakeholders yeah it's a great question um i you know i i don't think there's not one that's hard it's more about timing um, it's timing everything at the right time and making sure that, that um, something we think a lot about is, uh, we call it minimum viable network. Um, so in the middle mile piece of our business, when you were actually putting in cities, um, sizing the network such that it is super useful, has like an under five year payback. Um, and every node you add to that network makes it incrementally um, and hopefully exponentially more valuable. That's what, how we would determine a, a minimum viable network. Um, but trying to make that as small as possible. Um, so it's, you know, easy to put in and uh, quick to put in. Um, that's kind of the hardest piece. Yeah, the the, the regulatory piece is, is difficult. Um, but because we've kept it really close to the way that sewage and water lines are already regulated, um, it's a lot easier than people think. Uh, so that that's end of the day is not the the hardest part uh, of doing this. Um, it's it's probably up there. It's probably top ten, but um, it's not like the big glaring red flag yeah. people think it is. That's really interesting. I think there's a few. Um, uh, Brett Kugelmass is like working in the nuclear space, and he had a similar insight. It's just like then if you can really work to minimize the number of new things that you're doing, especially when you rely on either a big supply chain or big partners or anything like that. Um, man, does it make your life much easier unless it's like the thing that you need to unblock. Um, so what, what is, I know, well, we haven't yet painted really a picture of what's happening in the tunnels, which I think is important to do. Um, so like we've got, we've got a tunnel established. We've got a can of pears established. We got grocery stores, <laughs> distribution centers, and like the magic portal drawer in your house. Like what is the, what's happening inside that? 
Yeah, so as little as humanly possible, right? Like like you were saying, um, there's magic in making things simple and easy and old. Um, and so on the regulatory side for us, that's like, let's use literally the same pipe and construction methods and junctions and manholes that they use for any other utility, make it super easy, nothing new. Um, it's just, it makes that regulatory process so much easier. And the same thing on the engineering side. Um, we have, uh, like one of our first prototypes that I, I think is, uh, it, it, it looked great. So we put it on Twitter a lot. Uh, it was, <laughs> I have, have the cargo, uh, module right here. It's been, uh, it, the guys have, have taken so many parts off of it. Um, but I, I pulled it up here to try to save as, as much as I could. Uh, what it's so if you're just listening, it's like bigger than a bread box. It looks like a duffel bag size, like a, a weekender duffel bag with like rollerblade wheels on the bottom of it, basically. Ah, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, but there's so many cool little things there. Like there's all these different little pieces that are just so dope and I can talk about it forever. Um, and Canon, uh, our CTO, um, is just so good at hating complexity and making things simple. Um, which is a really, really tough skill to be good at. But I mean, like if, if me and him are fighting, that's probably what we're fighting about is he is just, he is so good at sticking to that. Um, so he's pulled so much complexity out. Um, so it's like everything now is, is, is really simple. So you have the distribution centers, you have your can of pears, I mean, you have your home and the goal was how do you make a utility layer that uses the fewest amount of parts that can be reassembled no matter where it's at. So the thing that's going up and down in your house to either, you know, accepting from something from the roof or pull something from out of the ground and then um, display it in the drawer that can we make that uh, component the same thing that's uh, storing things in a grocery store and uh, deploying that underground and deploying that to the roof. And um, that is a singular modular uh, vertical lift module it is what it's called. But it's like, like an elevator. Um, and, and how do you put the most amount of flexibility into that? Uh, while keeping it as simple as possible. Um, so you, you have that piece, uh, this is the up and down, and then you have, um, the robot, which is what I just showed, uh, for people listening, but that's what does the horizontal. Um, and then you have the, the rail, which is, um, it kind of, it, it takes away the pipe. I mean, you saw in this cargo module um, that I just showed, uh, it had the rollerblade wheels that were going and pushing. Um, it goes into the pipe and there's three wheels and it sits on the pipe, which seems like the best thing to do. And really early on, we were really sold on it because it was like, oh, no infrastructure in the pipe. We're good to go. Um, you just put, put that baby in and it's, it's rolling. Um, <laughs> but then you lose the ability um, to, uh, you know, transfer into a junction to, uh, go above ground and, or for that system to work, um, in the ceiling of a store or in the, the ceiling of an, uh, apartment building or the utility layer of apartment building, you, you lose all this flexibility because it always has to be in a pipe. Um, so we, we took that requirement, Ken took that requirement out, which he's so good at. Uh, and instead made a little rail. Um, and the rail is just so simple. It hurts. Uh, <laughs> it's not affixed to anything. It just slides in. Um, they're made in little links uh, that are extruded and, and you put them together and they can kind of wiggle and snake um, between each other. Uh, but that's what the robot actually rides on. So as long as that rail exists, then the, the robot can travel. Um, so that what is what handles the horizontal. So between those things, between the vertical um, lift mechanism and the robot, uh, it can move these totes around. And so the tote is, if you think about global shipping and how global shipping got so uh, efficient is, is ship containers. You put whatever weird objects you want to ship or whatever, you know, if it's a ton of can of pears, doesn't matter. It's going to be lifted and manipulated and stacked on a boat exactly the same because there it has this base unit shipping containers like the Lego box of, of freight. Um, so for us, it's, it's, uh, we, we use just the tote system, um, grocery stores, warehouses, um, all use about the same tote and, and a lot of them use exactly the same tote. Um, so we just use that, that same tote as our, our, our little tiny shipping container. Um, and then the, the elevator and the robot, um, handle that, that, sh uh, little tiny shipping container, and move it all around. 
That's so cool. I would have bet a thousand bucks that the shipping container uh, analogy was going to come up at some point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's kind of like we didn't mean to. This is never and like maybe we even kind of meant not to early on. Um, but the whole system mirrors a port accidentally. It's kind of frustrating because uh, it's not it, it, it's just interesting how like sometimes when you take all this complexity out, these systems just kind of trend to look exactly like each other. Um, but we have the vertical lift module, which is like the crane, the tote, which is like shipping container. And then you have your 18 wheeler, the train, which is the robot. Um, and the, the system kind of works exactly like that. Yeah. Which it seems like it makes perfect sense. You know, if you have, you have the macro system for the shipping container scale thing that gets it between continents or over any, any like double digit number of miles. And then you have this micro scale atomized version for totes that takes place like within any given city within a single digit number of miles or just feet um and it's interesting to think how many things would get re-architected like if this is a given right like if you're building a city from scratch of course you would want to include this thing um because I, I mean a mental exercise i love is just like walking around a modern city and being like what are all the things that are happening in parallel in this one kind of 2d plane of street right like even in new york where you've got like you've got subways you've got basements you've got but deliveries and bikes and people and as many things as you can sort of abstract like a layer up or a layer down that really expands the increases the quality of life but also increases the density at which city living is comfortable um and it's, it's just so cool. I mean, nobody was like stoked to see an 18 wheeler truck, like trundle down their residential street or idling outside their grocery store or anything. So just, yeah, packing that away, putting it all underground, I'm presumably making it much more cheap to transport for each individual item. I would think, um, I don't know. What's the, is it too soon to know what some of the economic outcomes of this are um, i'm also picturing this all as like electric but tell me if i'm wrong no no 100 percent. yeah yeah it i i think and I'll, I'll kind of talk about this um in kind of the terms of like i think something that's guaranteed that i don't think people are treating as a guarantee is autonomous logistics like forget us like we could fail it's gonna happen um there's so many people working on it it's so close it will come. The year it comes is the thing that, you know, I think throttles up and down, but it's going to happen um, at some point past that. Uh, we'll get to this uh, state of logistics that we call hyper logistics, just that there wasn't a word for it. Um, but it's, you know, if you have that receiving point in your home and you have that drawer and you get your can of pears, and you also get like a shirt, right? Well, you can just as easily send from that drawer. So that shirt that you wore, you don't necessarily need to keep it in, keep it in a laundry and then wash it and then uh, fold it and put it back in your drawer to wear again. You can just send it back to wherever you got that shirt from. You know, you've spent like 10 cents on a shirt rental. Uh, the transportation was basically free. So the company just let you use the shirt for a day and made eight cents. They do that every day for a whole year. They've made more on that shirt than they would just selling it once off. Um, so the quality of shirts pushes higher. And, you know, the amount of shirts that you use and, and don't use enough and, and just the amount of shirts the world needs goes way down. I think that's the most interesting ramification. If we can get to Atomic Logistics and then push towards people really easily being able to send back, which is that that's what we call hyper logistics. Um, just the, the, the access people have to higher quality things. Um, the, the amount that, because um, right now, like our consumerism is so tied to resource depletion, right? Like if I buy a screwdriver, I'm gonna use that screwdriver maybe like 20 times in my life. It will be like in a drawer somewhere. I'll have like five screwdrivers because I can't always find that screwdriver in the drawer. Um, but I need a screwdriver on hand. Uh, but eventually that screwdriver just like gets thrown away. Um, so if I could really easily, if I knew that I could always get a screwdriver in under 10 minutes for essentially free, use it. And then when I was done with it, just send it back. I wouldn't own a screwdriver and that screwdriver would be used by hundreds of other people. And so instead of having, you know, a few thousand screwdrivers distributed among all of us, we just all share this one really high quality screwdriver. And I think that's the most interesting one where consumerism and environmentalism like aren't in conflict. 
uh, you don't have to choose between them. You can consume as much as you want without having this like burden of, okay, now I'm, I'm filling the landfill with all this stuff that maybe I don't need. Um, so I think it's a really interesting one. Uh, that's kind of what gets us going every day is like, okay, how do we make that happen as soon as possible? Um, and then I think, yeah, I think there's similar to Amazon and Walmart and other, uh, logistics, um, inventions that, that really change the lives that we don't really think about. Um, just having access to things really cheap, just really changes how you live. Um, I mean, we, we, we center our lives around Amazon now. Uh, and it's crazy at the time people were saying like, who needs two day shipping? Like, come on, like you're just going to go to the store and buy it. It's like right down there. Why are they going to like, is that really something people that doesn't need to go that fast? And now we're like, one day. <laughs> oh, I can't get into our delivery until 6.30 p.m.? How am I supposed yeah. to cook dinner? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and there's like business models that will exist in that world that we can't even think of that like, you know, our grandkids will just be like, oh my gosh, how do you, oh, y'all live like that? That's crazy. Uh, yeah, but it's fun. I, I hope we get to live in that world and like see, you know, what it changes. It is so cool. I mean, it, it is the... I don't know if it's an order of math. It's somewhere between five and 10 X better than a thought experiment that I've been running for a few years, which is like, what I do a lot of long road trips. And so I'm like driving there, looking at all of these big ass trucks with drivers behind them with like regulations about, they have to stop every four hours and sleep every eight hours and all the costs associated with this. And I'm imagining like the Tesla skate, a big, an 18 wheeler version that can hold the drive autonomously. That's a huge battery that can hold a shipping container. They can drive 24 hours a day at the extremely minimal cost. And you think about everything around you, everything that you eat, everything that you drink, everything that you can see has been trucked over and over and over again and weighed and like it's slept overnight. It's been, you know, the cost of just getting the shit to you is so high and imagine that falling by i think the napkin math is like the tr the transportation should fall by at least a third maybe more and that as a percentage of the cost of everything that you consume and the speed that which you can get here just triples um so something that takes you know ten thousand dollars and three days to cross the country for you in, in even a world with just electric autonomous trucking, let alone the hyper logistics of the last mile, which as you said, is 40% of the cost, like people really underestimate the value and the cost savings and the quality of life increase that's going to come from these totally invisible to them for the most part, like technological improvements. Totally. And if you think about it too, like if you look at the food supply chain, that 40% last mile cost isn't just about making, you know, pears from Argentina cheaper. Th that is the reason it's hard to get local produce. Um, so if you, if you can bring that down to zero, then the incremental cost between uh, Argentinian pears. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I honestly don't know if you can grow pears in the U.S., Pears may be a bad example. Um, <laughs> I'm not a pear expert, but other produce you can grow. And so you can get it from a local farmer uh, for way cheaper. Cause like by that point, getting it from a grocery store or getting it from a farmer is about the same cost and time to get it to you. You've taken that huge incremental cost away. Um, and, and the whole local economy is able to um, uh, work better instead of having to ship all these things from outside the city into the city to, to make it cheaper. Um, so I think that'd be really interesting, just like flourishing local economies, kind of like, um, Shopify did for, you know, your friend being able to sell stuff online. It just it gave them a distribution point that was so much easier. Um, and now like I buy way more stuff from friends than I did before that. Um, doing the same thing, making that local economy, you know, my, my friend who makes salsa, I'm going to always, I'm just going to buy my salsa for my friend. It's like, it, just ship it to me. It's at your house, like ship it to me. Uh, you take that whole distribution layer that's so hard to, I mean, it's crazy that we all drink the same flavor soda because distribution's so hard. It's like Coke is just like, all right, you got five flavors, <laughs> like good luck. <laughs> and, and we're everywhere. And yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And I think that the combination of this trend with the trend of this kind of a uh, long tail e-commerce where, 
you know, we don't have the, we're all watching the same TV commercials anymore. Now we've all got different ads in our Instagram feed or whatever. And I'm like, oh no, I care a lot more about like, you know, I'd much rather eat masa chips than Doritos because like they use, you know, beef towel or coconut oil or whatever. Like they, I am a health oriented buyer of food and they are a health oriented brand and that's great. Um, and the logistics of like, I don't have to worry about whether it's stocked in the store because this network is taking care of it for me. And actually, as we like talk through this, I'm picturing it. I'm like, man, how much do we, how much time, effort and space do we waste merchandising things? Like the, no, I probably go, I probably order Instacart two or three times for every time I go to the grocery store. I don't give a shit that somebody like arranges the lettuce in an attractive way or like puts the cans of pears so that the labels are out. Like just pull, uh, pluck it point. from the distribution center, put it in the pipe, send it to my house. I know I'm going to buy the same 80% of my grocery bill is going to be the same things that happens every time. Um, yeah, it, it is a really like, there's a lot of cost savings that go into these invisible improvements. Yeah. It, it is interesting. Like our, our kids are, we're going to tell our kids about a grocery store and they're going to be like, oh my gosh, like, they made you do the pick and packing yourself at the warehouse. <laughs> You're like, yeah, I mean, kind of. We didn't see it that way, but yeah, I guess we were like working the warehouse. <laughs> They're like, so you did like IKEA for food because IKEA will still be around <laughs> for sure. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, <laughs> not going that. anywhere. Swedish meatball mode isn't going anywhere. No, <laughs> <laughs> we'll do anything for those. Uh, so, so tell me, like, now that we've got a picture of this thing, what is what are the toughest? technical problems i think i think some of the the hardest things the, the things we think a lot about is if you think about building like an infrastructure layer um of anything right it, it you you need this thing to work both from being able to be retrofit being able to make sense on roi so the cost has to be low it's got to be reliable enough to last a couple decades. Um, otherwise, your, rely, your ROI goes out the out the window. Um, so it's it's keeping everything really simple, keeping the modular pieces um, really small. That that way, we're not taking care of this huge suite of all these different pieces needed for all these different little applications. Um, sewage does this really well. You have like the basic toilet architecture that you couples to this basic coupling that goes into, um, you know, get like that cool little P trap to, to, you know, handle solids. There's all these little things that are just so standardized. Um, and it just works. It's crazy. It's crazy. Like if you think about it, we have a really good poop distribution system. Incredible. In Every city, like you can send that poop that really to just one place, but like it will go there. Um, it's crazy. Very reliably insanely reliably yeah. which and we the, think i guess i don't know well, and the benefits that's another you know as we think about the invisible benefits like it is very easy to take for granted how incredibly flawless and how important that sewage system is like that is one of the fundamental things that allows us all to like stay healthy and grow civilizations is like water plumbing even probably more fundamental than electricity like amazing it, it is crazy i i heard someone say the other day if the electrical grid went out they were like estimating the amount of deaths and at first i was like okay that's some that, that's a little over dramatic i don't think you know like a, i think it was like an eighth of the people in a city would die if the electricity was completely off in and i was like that's dramatic that's not a real stat but then they're going through and i was like oh my gosh we rely on electricity so much if we do lose the electrical grid that is every single piece of, of our, our lives is based on that grid working um it is it's just crazy how quickly like that's a relatively new thing uh and now our entire life is based on that thing working it's just wild and increasingly like the internet is the same like we rely on software which relies on the internet which relies on electricity and the level of dependencies i mean the uptime and the engineering that goes into that to your point is like so important and so incredible and we're so grateful for it um but we have to mind be mindful that like entropy is coming for us and if we don't continue to like maintain these things and improve them um continue to make our infrastructure better like the downsides can appear and can appear quickly. Um, it's like that meme of like, you know, one COBOL 
program, like holding up the entire modern economy um, <laughs> or like some, some duct tape thing. But I appreciate that you're, you're bringing such like the simplicity and the engineering piece to it. Um, I just, I just want to say that that is all canon. And um, oh, just we have a great engineering team who thinks really, really critically about that which is such a blessing um, because usually like a tension between, you know, biz dev and engineering where engineering wants to do cool things and biz dev wants to cheap and like efficient things. And like, can the, like Cannon's a great CEO. He understands the business side. He understands the engineering side. He does all that internal conflict management himself, which is so helpful. (laughs) Um, So that, that is all from them. I just, uh, blessed to have them. (laughs) That is um, an underrated, skill and mental model actually is as i was um so i'm working on this book on elon uh like a compilation of just like like the almanac and of all and one of the things you know talking about that people are always like what's unique about it i was like this is i don't know if this is well known or appreciated or a thing that people gloss over but he is as he's an incredible engineer but he is as much of like an economics and finance brain as he is an engineer and he's like Every other company on earth, there's a finance guy and there's an engineer and they have to discuss everything to come to an agreement and they're always making trade-offs that both of them are angry about. He's like, I have all the variables of every trade-off in one head and I can make decisions faster and I can make the right trade-offs within a big picture and there's no there's no like off compromises in there. Um, so it, it just shows the importance of having all the mental models in your head and having people who really uh, deeply appreciate the, the disciplines, like all of the disciplines and making synthesis across all of them to make a system like this work. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. I, you know, I think that's, it, it's it, like, it, it is interesting. Um, I think sometimes we get a little too, I mean, having like this, like iconic founder of these like hard tech companies, I think is a little bit just like the front man is the rock star in a band. Um, and it's a little annoying and it's, it's, you know, because I, I think a lot of it comes to down to like how media distribution used to work and you only had like space for one person to get all the recognition. But it is, I, I think it's also like to your point, it, it's because you need, it's so hard to communicate a lot of that tension. And so one person who can balance all those different pieces of a business and, and have those internal conflicts themselves makes everything run more efficiently. Um, I think, I think for a variety of reasons, we've kind of taken the approach that the future of companies is run from like a group of five of those people, um, rather than a single person. Um, and I I think you've seen this in kind of like open AI is a good example. Um, but I think there's, there, I think the future of of companies is for a couple of reasons. One easier for all of them to get media recognition, um, just with social media. Like we have more room for more people to, to be known from a company. Um, but yeah, I, I I think also the the ability for just like uh, I, I think something that's that founders in our generation maybe are better at than others is just like that uh, they don't need to be the front man. They're able to like work together a lot easier. Um, I don't know. I've just seen a lot a lot of companies that that work better that way than uh, kind of the the single dictator. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes that's. Sometimes that's the reality, even if you don't see it. Is you know, it's more more Rolling Stones than uh, you know, Share or something like. Um, so it sounds like um, I, I love the analogy to the the plumbing and sewer system because, you know, at one point that that was all technology, but as we you know, as you talk me through it, I'm like picturing it. I'm like, yeah, there's a lot of like really simple, just like physics machines. You know, the water goes in, the water comes down. It happens one thousand times out of one thousand. And it's very mechanical and very simple. And as I'm picturing what you're doing here, you like you have to build a new form factor and you have a, some tough interchanges and stuff to do, but you're not, and maybe in some areas you are, and I would love to hear about them, but like, there's not unsolved technical problems in here. There's not a ton of things where there's not some prior art or some prior engineering solution. It's just a challenge of building the simplest, most reliable, cheapest most like rugged bulletproof version of this system and the tough part it sounds like is the actual implementation and the distribution and the partnerships uh, yeah 100 percent. um and that's like frustrating as an engineer you know <laughs> uh because it's like so much more fun to be like and it's so much more comforting to be on the cutting edge you're like 
okay, there's this thing that's never been made before. And like, no one's going to care if I don't make it. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm going to try my hardest and like, it gets, and then if we do it, it's like, oh my gosh, we discovered this new thing. Like, uh, you know, I think what we're doing is more like Lego blocks. Like all the Lego blocks are there. You just got to put it, there, there's like a few combinations where they work. We got to find one of those combinations where we put the right Lego blocks together and then this thing works and, and goes. Yeah, man. This is a pattern. I think a lot of people... It, and your company to me feels very much like a deep tech company. Like you have a bold vision of the future. Um, you're not technically maybe like doing a thing, any individual engineering piece that's never been done before, but you are definitely building a system that's never been done before. And that actually characterizes a lot of super high tech cutting edge companies like, um, like Adam Limbs and General Fabrication. And like, there's a lot of technology fragments out there that are either cutting edge or are actually 20 years old, but no one's just ever packaged it with the right stuff and commercialized it and done the hard work to go to market, get the partners aligned, get governments involved and like get the thing out there. And like, that's where the, that's where the world really changes and where the value is really created. So I'm, I'm psyched to see you guys doing this. So let's talk about the, if the, if the hardest part is the distribution and the wedges and the alignment, let's talk through that. Like, what does the, What's, what's the maze like on that side of things? You're changing all the time. Um, you know, we, we, that, that is the thing that we, we, uh, have a, a monthly meeting every month. Um, we've now kicked it to quarterly. Uh, I'm hoping that is, uh, because, um, we, we figured more of the maze out. Uh, but it was like to step back and be like, okay, like, are we going down? Cause like you, you kind of get one or two shots at it. Um, so we're always trying to like, make sure we're, we're going down the right path. I, I think right now where we're, um, what we think is the right stair step is to go after this market, um, uh, called instant pickup. That, that's the, the, what we call it internally, but, um, it's automating people's pickup product. Um, so pickup is, um, this, like, it, it's kind of like this new USB hub for stores and restaurants, um, where this is how people are interacting, uh, uh, you know, Starbucks is a great example. They have the massive pickup product. Um, but it's also how delivery drivers, um, interact with restaurants, right? That's like so much of a store it used to be dine in and drive through, and now it's mostly drive through and pickup. Um, but pickup remains this thing that is really expensive. Um, it's not a great experience. It, it's usually slower than drive through. It, it's more energy than drive through. Um, but like you've already ordered the thing, it's like done, like whether that's, you go to a grocery store and it's already picked and packed or where the food's already made or your coffee's already made. Um, it really should be the fastest, best experience. Um, so because we've like put so much work into decreasing the cost and decreasing the, um, implementation of all these components, uh, we can build a really cheap automated system, uh, for doing that. Um, so making, you know, we, the, the goal is to, whether it's a grocery store or a restaurant, um, make that pickup time under 30 seconds. Uh, so you, you come in, don't have to get out of your car and when you're at a restaurant, pick up your item and, and keep going. Um, and that's something we tested. What does that interaction that? look like? It, it's, it's really similar to, uh, you ever been at a pharmacy, uh, like CVS uh, pharmacy, not the outside lane where you're picking up from the pneumatic tube, which is great. But like, you got to like really reach out there uh pharmacy has this great drawer oh yeah, yeah. that like comes up right against your car and you're just like uh it's it's basically okay. that uh <laughs> um we, we really that but automated is probably the closest way very cool um yeah. okay and you have um so what are the, the wedges in that market like who are the people who are doing the most of those that you you can go work with um, that is, that is, that right there is the biggest reason we have not been able to talk about stuff lately, uh, which is so annoying. Cause I love, like I, I used to fight with our IP lawyers and they're like, you can't show this or you've lost your IP rights. It's like, fine. <laughs> like, I'm not, okay. Like, I'm not going to like not show what we're doing because I don't want someone to strap on skateboard wheels onto a metal fixture. Like, it's fine. We'll lose that IP. Um, but when you're working with like, we, we've gotten, um, lucky enough to work with, um, uh, partners and kind of co-developing with them. And, uh, that, that has been, I don't, I, I have not figured out how to be transparent and talk about what we're doing a lot 
while also balancing working with partners that haven't been announced yet. That's been like a real tension. So, um, did you guys have a thing with Wendy's announced? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. They really, they really pushed to. Um, they were the one that like pushed to like, hey, we're just going to announce this. Um, and so like, yeah, it was great. So they, yeah. it's very helpful. Like, <laughs> I'm, how did I'm how did that, that come about? I mean, that feels like a huge like a, a dream partnership for a young pipe dream. Yeah, totally. So, um, you know, with the, I don't know if I've ever talked about it. It was just a cold email. Um, we were just cold. Dude, yeah, just cold, cold email, email for life. Yeah, 100%. We've gotten some, I mean, hopefully these come out in the next like six months, but like, we've gotten some crazy things from cold emails. Wendy's is a good example, but like, it, we, yeah, it's crazy what you can do with cold email. As we're picturing, you're trying to build this whole giant internet of, um, hyper logistics. And it sounds like the sort of first link in the chain, the first router, I don't know what the right analogy is there, is this instant pickup thing. Yeah, you nailed it. Okay. That's what we think about it. Yeah. Is this instant pickup. So so we think about, yeah, uh, Canon has a great analogy where um, like any big protocol that comes up, um, the people who win it are the ones who um, capture the, it, there's like an equation of the amount of volume that passes through you, right? So when we're thinking about, we think about like building the network based on nodes. So you want to pick nodes that have the highest amount of volume flowing through them. So right now that's not middle mile, which is like connecting in between different places. That's like a, there's a lot of volume going through cities, but not through that modality. But there is a lot of volume going through pickup and delivery in store. So that, those are great nodes to capture. And then once you build up that base of nodes, then being able to extend it from there, you have a lot of options. Um, so we really think about it as like, this is an inevitable network that is going to exist sometime in the next five to 10 years. And what can we do to both make it happen sooner and capture the biggest piece of it um, as it grows. So instant pickups is a great thing that people want now. It's profitable per unit. Um, people really want it. And uh, it also, it's a good business and also it's a wedge to build an yeah. better business. This is, this is something that I think you guys are being really smart about that also a lot of even really ambitious deep tech founders underestimate the importance of sequencing, like finding a plateau. You can like scrabble up to this plateau of like economic stability and then like establish it and expand it and then scrabble up another, like take the technical risks one at a time instead of be like, we're gonna network a whole city. It's gonna cost $200 million and then like maybe it'll work. Um, so I think this is really smart. Tough though, man, it's tough. It's tough to see because you can also sequence too small. Um, we spent a lot of time, I've, I've never heard anyone talk about this. Um, I've always been inspired by Walt Disney's flywheel. I don't even know if he actually made it. Uh, but that thing... We love rocks. a flywheel. And so, he, God, so great. But it is like, we. so we saw that one day and just like, I don't know. I saw it. It was just like, it clicked. And so at our, our monthly meeting that we modeled, it was super early on. It was maybe like first one or two months. So there wasn't much of a flywheel, but it was like, okay, we exist as this unit to build something and make money we need people to know about it. <laughs> so we need like social media distribution. Uh, from there, we'll build, you know, uh, so social trust. That social trust will convert into intros to VCs. And then the VC money goes back into the company. The company kicks out engineering. The engineering creates content, content. And then it's like, okay, like, they, like there really is a flywheel here. And like, it really helps you model, okay, inputs and outputs, what actually matters to spinning this thing. So we, we, we've kind of kept that tradition. We always, now it's like this big, massive flywheel that's so helpful in like understanding what inputs and outputs are in the company. Um, just needs to go. So man. important, yeah. Step four, go on Eric's podcast. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Dude, the, fly, the flywheels are so, it's so helpful to identify when you're putting something, when you're wasting effort, when you're like doing something that just kind of like spins off and doesn't add momentum to the core system of the business. Um, okay, I think it, given all of this context, I'm now very curious, like, who do you have to be to for this to become the company that you start? Like, how did you become the person that is doing this? Oh, man. 
Um, I have no, I have no idea. Uh, I don't. Uh, I'm gonna phone my therapist <laughs> in real quick. I, so. That's for the that's for the biographers to answer, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, I have no idea. Um, I I think if I was like backtrack, it was. Um, I grew up like in the South, um, pretty religious, grew up homeschooled, like super sheltered. Um, but I loved like making things. I think you're the same way. It's like making something and then someone giving you money for it. It's like this holy religious transaction. It's like someone liked your thing more than they liked their money. That there's no better sign (laughs) that thing you made is sick. (laughs) That's so it's like that thing was just the coolest. I was like, okay, well, if I want to do that, I should make like the coolest things ever. I'm gonna go be an engineer, and then the money takes care of itself. And then realized as I went to college and halfway through college, I was like, oh, I've got this backwards. Like the real key is putting the business model around the innovation. Uh, that's actually how you win. So I am in the wrong place. Um, and so when I when I left college, I decided, okay, I'm not gonna get an engineering job. That feels like a dead end and like the wrong type of flywheel. Like people just really get stuck there. And so I kept having my professors like, is there such thing as like a part-time engineering job? And at the time they're like, that's no, what are you talking about? So it's like, okay, well, I guess I'll just like not get a job and make money through business. If I like, it kind of like a keep pushing a baby bird out of a nest and like it will fly before it's the ground. Like I will make money from a business before my rent's due at the end of the month. Uh, or I hope so. And so, um, I did that and then eventually found a, um, part-time engineering job at a prosthetic startup. Um, but I was just like kick, cranking stuff out and like really learning how to, um, like what matters and like how to see PMF versus not PMF and, um, scale sales and like, kind of like, that's where I learned cold emailing, just like a ton of cold emailing. Um, but I had like all these little, like, you know, I learned to code and built these SaaS businesses. Um, I, I was big bubbler before bubble was cool. I love bubble so much. That's like this no code platform that just like it rocks. It's to this day is, I think the best way to build software. I'll, I'll die on that hill. Um, but I, I made like all these, all these apps and they were like, they did fine. They, it wasn't a blockbuster, but I made my rent. Um, and so that's where I really like learned and, and got into the Paul Graham essays. And that was, I went down that rabbit hill and realized like, oh, this is a whole asset class for like early ventures. Um, so just like, learned a lot. And it's like, okay, I want to take one big swing. Um, and I think like I learned really early on, you can make something. And then like 30 days after you make something, if it's like lucky enough to be successful, you don't own that thing anymore. It owns you. And you're just kind of like keeping the wheels on the wagon, but it's it's going down the hill. Uh, so it's like, if if I'm going to spend the next 10 years of my life doing something, I want to pick something that's going to be something I love owning me. Like I am so fine being um, subservient to this thing. And like, I'm okay with 10 years of failure just because I love this thing so much. So uh, I decided to take two years off. Um, the company I was I was doing part-time engineering for asked me to come on full-time to run biz dev. So I thought, okay, great. Two years, I'll learn to scale a startup at that startup. And I'll also shut down everything else I'm doing and just use that two, two years to find the best tenure opportunity. Um, and it was just during that, that uh, last mile logistics just felt like that thing that by 2030, I'd look back and be like, oh, thank goodness I was working in that industry at that time. It was like, no one was working in it. And it was like uh, an obvious thing that by 2030, it would be taking off at least some. Um, and Jeff Bezos has this great quote that always stuck with me. Um, he says it's so much better, but it's like some version of like, you want to be in industries where you know where the puck is going. Um, so like logistics is that people want things cheaper and faster. They always will, no matter what they say, even a small increment of little easier, little cheaper, little faster goes such a long way. And that's just always going to be true. So it's like easy to like, okay, I'm going to go in, I'm going to build in this space. Uh, and as long as we can make logistics a little cheaper, a little easier, um, a little faster who knows how big it will be, but like we'll win a little bit. Um, so once like the, 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 once we, it, I think we we're like six months in when I was like, okay, that's what I'm going to do. And then the next year and a half was like, okay, but what do we build? And it was like, eventually we got to what pipe dream is now, but, um, 
what was that year and a half of of like we think we want to tackle this problem improvements are a no-brainer which i love as a place to start to okay here's the huge this whole space of things that we could tackle to try to uh, like improve this how did you narrow that down to what you eventually started building yeah i you know i got super lucky it, the, the two years was i really wanted to learn to scale a startup there wasn't as much forethought in but I, I i see it now where it's so good to not build like i am just such a builder i want to like go after things like i have an idea i'm just going to build it i'm going to test it you know um i love that it's just so fun um but if we had done that i we'd have a drone company 100 percent uh because i love i love drones so much i'm blinded <laughs> by it um i think drones are just the just the coolest man and so when we, when we thought like okay last mile logistics where we need to be we're like bang drone company time uh we've done drone projects before and they're just like so fun and just like the best um but we realized like okay like there's there's so many people doing drones what in a drone world what else is going to be needed that's really what we should look at um let's assume that they will happen soon and the people who are leading them are going to win um and then it's some some version of like it, it, there's not a huge space i don't know if this is true our theory was that there's a small window where drones are lucrative before they push commodity right after regulations lift right before um i think you kind of see this in uh weapons is like you used to have like these super high-tech drones but then once you started to figure this out and then then everything just pushes so cheap and the software is off the shelf, then then the whole thing becomes pre pretty commodified. Um, I don't know if that's where it'll go, but we felt like we we weren't as clear on that as we should be if we we're going to start something for the next ten years. Um, so then then we went back to okay, what are the other pieces of this network that's going to be needed and a high volume, high speed, uh, high uptime um, kind of mainline pipe, and and then also being able to go in and out of buildings was something that a lot of customers and cities told us. Um, as we were talking to people, um, and just like banged our heads in the wall, looking at like bike lane robots and sidewalk robots, self-driving car robots, like low altitude drones. Uh, uh, oh, the coolest one. Canon had this concept for electrical wire cable robot, oh. uh, riding electrical wires. Um, I think that's our Midwest roots <laughs> coming out. We're like electrical wires everywhere. Might as well use them. Um, but yeah, eventually we were like, okay. If cities have already said best way to do mass distribution is underground pipes and anything that's above ground eventually needs to go underground because it's the most efficient, safest, reliable. Um, maybe that's where the secret is. If it was like, if we didn't have two years, we would have never diligenced it because it was just like, that's the dumbest thing we've ever heard of. Like, what a regulatory nightmare. What a cost, it's going to be so cost prohibitive. Like, if fiber is taking this long, something bigger is going to take even longer. And it's like, but let's go diligent. Let's ask cities like what they think. Let's ask people who put in infrastructure what they think. Um, and everyone had an answer similar to like, well, that thing I'm an expert in is actually pretty easy. Um, like it happens all the time. Like, no problem. That person's thing is going to suck though. And it was like, okay, like everyone in like, it's, it's just a bunch of stigmas all coupled together. This is actually pretty easy um, relatively. Uh, and so, yeah, that's when we were like, okay, let's just, let's go for I it. I fucking love that. I love that you did the work to go tackle every individual assumption and not just let them get tangled up together and be like, ah, oh, that's a messy knot. Um, and, and I'm sure to some extent uh, embrace the fact that like, it'll be tough and probably slow, but also that's a moat. And that is, that is just more proof that this thing needs to be done. And that somebody with like broad shoulders and a thick head needs to go after it and get it done um i love that and and i hope more people follow that example and are encouraged by you breaking through this wall like that's amazing um i would love to sort of as we as we wind down here um i like to ask like the 50 year question so you're a few years in you've spent a lot of time thinking about what this could look like and we we very we are very consistently like terrible underestimators of what can happen over over like even 20 years so 50 should really stretch us but we'll most of us will live to see that so like what do you think hyper logistics looks like in 50 years 
yeah, great question. Um, I think automated production gets so good. And I think we've always had this idea of like this everything machine existing in our homes, like desktop 3D printers were supposed to be that. And like uh, desktop 3D printers are like early versions of VR or like maybe super early versions of AI. Where it's not even, we don't even use the same methodology or materials or anything. Like it's all so different. But the idea that like a machine can make any shape or, you know, almost any shape, it's just so magical. It was like, yeah, that thing is going to exist somewhere. But I think like, if you look at even like computing, everything pushes to really co-located, high power, always on machines that then get distributed nearby. Um, like water, sewage, electrical, like we don't produce that thing in our homes. We produce it nearby and it gets piped in. Um, same thing with um, uh, yeah, computers is like the, me, the compute me and you are using is like 10% on our computer and 90% uh, in a, I have no idea if that's true. Uh, some version of that, right? Like our, our computers are a thin client for the compute that's happening uh, nearby. And I think something really similar happens where a lot of what comes into a city comes into the warehouse area. Um, and then there's, it's all co-located and, and we're just piping in raw materials. So like we're getting, you know, the, uh, the plastics, the, um, the seedlings, the, um, like to the very base layer things. And then we're, you know, we have really efficient automated farming. We have really efficient, um, closed production, we have really efficient, like these, these machines that can just build anything. Then you order it and it gets sent to you. And then when you're done with it, you send it back. I, I think like that at some point exists and it's kind of, it's gnarly. I think it's so cool. Like if you, you'll have a shirt spun up for you and then we'll be so good at, at, at disassembling that shirt. It'll be made to be disassembled. So that yarn is in some crazy configuration for you something that no one else is probably going to want, but has never made sense to manufacture because you have to manufacture so many of them. And then if you don't use it, it just gets thrown in the landfill. We'll be so good at like assembling and then disassembling. You can just like have anything you want sent to you for basically free. And I think between that and AI, like the amount that of human effort you need to put into accumulating the things that you need to survive, that like ratio just goes all the way down. Um, and like the, the amount of human effort you need to put to like get the clothes and the food and the, uh, medicine and all the stuff you need is so little. Um, I think there's like a real chance to get there in the next 50 years. Uh, that's hopefully. awesome. I mean, I, I, I think about the nanotech and the like molecular recycling stuff, but you're right. It's probably unlikely to happen in our house. And so the combination of like hyper logistics and either city or neighborhood or something like yeah, reconfiguration of physical materials could be really, really cool. Um, that's fascinating. And then if you're relying on that, there's like other things that need to happen, but I think we'll be a lot less tied to a single location. I think like if you have, if all your stuff is in the cloud, just like all your data is in the cloud, right? Like this laptop used to be the sacred thing. Cause like, all, like, oh my gosh, all my stuff is there on that laptop. I can't lose that laptop. Now, if I lost my laptop, I'd be like bummed because I got to get a new laptop and I get home. I've got laptop <laughs> money sitting around. But uh, like, I want to work. All my stuff is just in the cloud. Like, I don't care. Like, I don't, I'm not sentimental to that thing. And I think like the ability to like, even a family, like with kids, being able to just have all their stuff all the time, being able to get to you really easily um means you could just like hop around and live in different places um I, that, that one may not be true uh but i think it's a possibility you know i think our kids will be tied to their location less and like maybe they will want to live by their friends you know in another city for a couple months and then come back to another city with some other friends for a couple very months. cool um okay who are who are like dream partners dream opportunities um, and in general, like how can all of us who are, who are sort of like listening, watching and supporting you be useful to the, to the mission? Oh yeah. Um, we, our biggest problem is always finding great people. Um, and we have just like, I don't know how I'm so lucky to work with the people I get to work with, but like 
if you want to work with just people that you're in awe of every day about how their brain works and how good they are and, and have that rub off on you. Um, and you're one of those people that is just like, people would say like, oh man, they're just good at whatever they do. They're just like, I don't know what it is. Um, if you want to be somewhere where that is rewarded, highlighted, um, and then external people will know about it, uh, we want to work with you so bad. <laughs> um, or if you know someone like that, let me know. Um, that, that is our, our biggest, uh, that's our, always our biggest problem. So um, that, that would be the most helpful. And like right now, uh, yeah, I don't, if you can tell, I, I'm a little tired. Uh, we need some more people. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I'd appreciate it. My wife would appreciate it. The team would appreciate it. Um, I got to get a little more sleep. I got my blanket and pillow in the background there. But um, yeah, uh, that would be so. Okay, if you want to go somewhere where great coworkers will rub off on you, DM Garrett. <laughs> I, I heard it. I heard it what when you, I said it. I was like, what are you talking right. about? <laughs> that's going to get edited out. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm not editing else. that out yeah. at all. In your dreams. <laughs> That's a closer. It doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> the title of the podcast. Um, seriously, thank you. Thank you so much for for biting off an incredible challenge, for doing the hard work, for sleeping in your office. Um, I'll salute anybody with a pillow and blanket in there. Um, you guys are building awesome stuff. I hope everybody follows along, supports. Um, I can't wait to I can't wait to see one of these things in action. Um and it is it is yet another seedling in the like forest of kind of amazing visions of the future that uh, that we're all growing here. So it's very cool. Appreciate it. this was this was such a great time. This is such a great podcast. I forgot that we were even recording it uh, half. Perfect. Um, that's that's how we <laughs> like to be.